So I just finished reading the book, Nickel and Dimed, by Barbara Ehrenreich. Um, it was published in 2001. It's a fairly straightforward book. Uh, Barbara goes to several cities. She's an upper middle class uh, person, a writer, and uh, she's part of the great wealth of the world. Uh, she goes and she works in Florida, Maine, and Minnesota in jobs uh, that I wouldn't want to have. And you wouldn't probably either, or maybe you do have one. Uh, jobs that people are stuck in, the working poor, uh, people who work as hard as they can, and because of the way poverty works, uh, they simply can't gain much. Uh, there's the belief that if we work hard and we do, do good stuff, that we can get ahead. It can be very, very difficult. Uh, and, and certainly in my own lifestyle here, I've, I've learned about that and learned to live with much less. And I am in favor of that. But the truth is a lot of people are totally trapped in, in poverty. Now, she only looks at the, at the U.S., and although a lot of the people that, uh, that are in low-wage jobs in the U.S. come from other countries, perhaps they're refugees or immigrants, uh, and they may not have the options even <clears throat> that she had. I do appreciate in the book very much that she does talk about how her experiment with going and working in these jobs and observing how things work for the working poor is very artificial. She has the option of, well, she, she's going to return to her normal life after a fairly short time. I think she only worked a month in each place. So, so it's very different than somebody whose whole life and, and family has been trapped in difficult economic situations and, and they just simply don't have the bootstraps to pull up. <laughs> um, and then when we look at internationally, uh, you know, of course, the problem is even worse, uh, where you've got lots of people working that you never see uh, in other countries to make things cheaper for the wealthy of the world. So her her um, her experiences are fairly interesting to read. I enjoy them greatly, and I think that, that reading the descriptions of, of how the actual lifestyle issues play into keeping someone in difficult position uh, are very interesting. So those personal experiences are very important to, to read, but her concluding chapter is very good on uh, stating some, some of her thoughts about the bigger picture. I, I think she's coming from a Marxist perspective, which I certainly don't. Uh, depending on what Marxism even is. Uh, and she sees the problem, but she doesn't know how to solve it. Um, she has some statements that she makes, and I think that's part of it. But I think it's actually wider spread and bigger than that, and especially if we consider the worldwide view. Anyway, I would recommend the book highly. It's nickel and dimed. It's a fairly straightforward read, and it's old. But the problems are, because it's 2001, right? Uh, now it's 2018. It was published in 2001. But the problems that exist are still there, and we're becoming more aware of them, which is great. Uh, she was writing this in an era when most people did not have internet, and now uh, with telephones, we are meeting each other, we can publish things, we can see each other's lives, and, and uh, I think that's going to cause the ability to communicate better and remove one of the problems that keeps people ignorant and poor is ignorance. They just don't have the information. So information is now getting out there. And I think that that's going to cause some difficulties for us and some of those difficulties we should have. And, and we can um, take people whose lives really suck and, <laughs> and uh, balance things out a little bit so that, so that they don't suck as much. Now, it's interesting to think about in terms of labor, someone does need to do the cleaning. Someone does need to do the food preparation in restaurants, for example. And I like the economies of scale in, in a lot of those kind of systems. But uh, most people don't want to do that job. Now, in many cases, we can actually get rid of those jobs, which sounds great, uh, with automation and artificial intelligence, etc. But uh, we don't get rid of the people. And so we have to invest in, in people so that they have... Uh, other value outside of the things that we're automating. Otherwise, we're creating a really dangerous situation where people who could barely get by before now really cannot at all survive, which actually the people she describes, uh, they're not in a safe situation at all. They're, they're not, I mean, it's a waste of human life. 
it's it's terrible. Now, of course, people vary in their skills, um, and of course, as with anything, I uh, bring it back to Bosque and how things could work here. Uh, one of the advantages of being here is that labor is cheaper, but I also don't want to be part of promoting inequality by having wealthy people come from outside and pay, uh, many of whom don't want to pay anything. They're actually very happy to support inequality by, by traveling to Mexico and, and paying as little as possible for everything because they want everything to be cheap and a good deal and, and even more so in the Bosque because it's about living uh, cheaper and sustainably and so forth. Uh, they're, they're even more so uh, if they feel even more justified in taking advantage of poor people. <clears throat> you know, and these are liberal people who think that they're against inequality, but they're actually enforcing inequality. So what do we do then here? Uh, you know, I mean, I could offer an experience where, where people come and they have to, like, sweep their own cabana. Uh, we can live really simply so that they can not have a big, complex system that needs a lot of inf infrastructure support. So living simply can also be about promoting greater equality because people can take care of their own things. We can also get rid of a lot of superfluous consumerism that has to be supported by various forms of oppression uh, in normal society. Uh, but a lot of people, if they're paying to come here, you know, I don't want to have them spending their time doing uh, fairly what we call menial labor. And there are a bunch of people who want jobs, who who don't have a lot of opportunities, and the Bosque for them can be an amazing opportunity to learn and develop as well. So if we were to go in our hiring uh, and seek out the absolute best among the people who are trapped in poverty, uh, they would benefit greatly, uh, their society would benefit greatly, and we'd be uh, still paying uh, more than they can get elsewhere, but a very big part of their Bosque experience should be uh, learning and studying to improve their skill set. And this could be important for <clears throat> even their entire family long term. If, if, if certain people can get, get these greater skills, then, uh, then we've increased their value. And of course, hopefully some of them will be loyal to the place and still stick around and still do some of this type of work, or we can move them into other types of positions as we develop them, and they become teachers, activity leaders, uh, tour guides, and and then we seek new people who don't have a lot of opportunity. And yeah, we're using their labor. Uh, we're using cheaper labor, uh, but we're doing it in a way that then funnels money from the first world into developing people and families uh, in, in very rural and... Um, impoverished areas. I think that's a good solution. Uh, would it be ideal if we could pay everybody a huge amount? Sure. Can't do it. <laughs> and uh, really, there is no way that the world can function the way it's set up right now uh, to maintain the extreme wealth of the wealthy, many of whom don't think they're wealthy. Like the people who complain about the 1% often are in it worldwide. <clears throat> so... Uh, that's a little bit of my take on, on what we can do here, how things could possibly function to at least have a little bubble that's finding a way out of this problem. So we, we, we have very fulfilling, simple ways of living that cost less and simpler systems. Um, that's difficult. I mean, I, I've found that there's immense cost to running this project, um, even though on, a, on an industrial world scale, it's very cheap to run it. So... <laughs> Uh, but if you don't have any money, which I've, I've done my own personal, I guess, exploration into poverty, then you're in a sort of really inherently weak position, and it's very difficult to change anything. So, so anyway, the factors we can, we can get into here are living cheaper, and so we're actually teaching the wealthy of the world how to live cheaper, and then, uh, and then going ahead and, and looking for the best uh, among those who are, who are in, in poor families and poor areas, and increasing their value to such a level that that could have a lasting impact on their whole community. Uh, we can also be teaching values like good eating and, and, and eating in a way that doesn't result in having diabetes, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and um, 
So yeah, that's kind of an optimistic vision of how, how we could use current economic inequality to support a system while bringing people out of poverty.